Welcome, you sick bastards. Tonight, I have got a fucking fantastic guest. Um, really, really excited about having this gentleman on. Um, I, I thought about it a long time ago, and I was like, nah, he'll never say yes. Even though I know that he's a much cooler guy than that, because he's so incredibly freaking kind to me. Um, all the advice he's given helping me with getting my film out there. Uh, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, this guy has some pretty good credentials here. I'm a huge fan. Um, from horrorfix.com, Night Terrors Radio, currently working on Eft Tales from the End Times, about to release a board game called Slice and Dice, which sounds fucking rad. And my personal favorite that I'm going to fanboy on here in just a little bit, Holes in the Sky, Mr. Ash Hamilton. Thank you so much for coming on my shitty little podcast. Um, it is a pleasure to have you, sir. It really is. Um, and I just, I, I look forward to to getting to know you a little bit tonight. And uh, again, just thank you. And let's uh, let's hear it from you. Tell, tell us about yourself, sir. Oh, hey, thanks for having me on. Um, you know, as, as my wife will attest, I will talk about myself to great lengths. Um, so, <laughs> much to her chagrin sometimes, but, uh, yeah. So, you know, you gave me a, a great intro, so it's going to be sort of, you know, hard to compare to that, but, um, so, um, I am, I, I guess you want to call it a filmmaker. I, I do make movies and, um, I'm a long time horror enthusiast. I've been uh, running horrorfix.com now for, geez, about 12 years. Um, and uh, I, I basically love ev everything in, in the genre. Um, I've always been a big fan of horror and, and sci-fi and fantasy and stuff like that, you know, since I was uh, a little kid. And, you know, as, as I get older, strangely, it's like I still have <laughs> most of the same interests. I like to think that I've grown just in a little bit. <laughs> But I just went back with adult money to buy action figures that I sold at garage sales, you know, when I was like 10 or 11, <laughs> you know, when I, when I got out of like the toy phase and then I got back into the toy phase. So, yeah, I, I, I love everything like that. I, I love, um, you know, like old, uh, you know, circa 70s and 80s toys and collectibles. And I've got a bunch of those that surround me about any time. Um, my mother was a big enthusiast of horror films and you know i come from you know a generation that uh you know bridges technology you know because i i didn't have the internet when i was a kid I, obviously I'm, I'm older than that and um i i'm actually like pre-cable I'm, I'm that old so <laughs> i remember um having like three stations because we were in a pretty rural town in the midwest so that's strangely those are really fond memories for me though even though i love the accessibility that we have now i love being able to say you know what was that film and then being able to look it up and then being able to download it or stream it or whatever you know like that is really cool to me i love the fact that you and i can talk because growing up without that kind of you know availability or access to the world if you're like a weird kid, and, and I was a fucking weird kid, man. I'm sorry, can I swear? Absolutely, tear it up. Okay, I was I was the weirdest fucking kid. I was a weirdo. Um, that was really hard to uh, connect with people, you know. Like, um, I, I was still like a little boy in the sense that, like, you know, I played like team ball. And stuff. I was outside and I was getting dirty and having you know, like BB gun wars. You know, sorry, mom, I we were supposed to do any of that, but um, doing that kind of shit. And, but my, my heart was always in movies, you know, so it was really difficult, like, you know, as like an 11 or 12 year old kid to like grab another kid your age and be like, Hey, you know, it's like, I've got a, a, a VHS of Lucio Fulci's gates of hell. You want to come over and watch it? You know, these kids are looking at me like, who is this fucking weirdo? Like, who is this kid? You know, it was, it was difficult, especially in a town of like 600 people. You know, it's like make those connections. The nearest town was about 40 minutes away. And I would beg my parents to take me there because they had a bookstore. And the bookstore had like stacks of old magazines. So I was able to go through like just these stacks of like famous monsters of film land, 
uh, old creepies, eeries, um, fangos, if they had them and stuff like that, you know. So it was always this quest. You know, it was always an adventure. Like, how do I learn more about, you know, movies? Because you're in a, a rural town in the middle of nowhere. Our town was a, the nearest town, which was about the same size, was about nine miles of, of cornfields away. You know, and you get to that town and there's really nothing there either. <laughs> it's just a mirror image of the town you just came from. You know, it's, it's like a uh, it's like a Russian doll. It's just like, a, you know, little little town inside little town inside little town. Mm-hmm. And then eventually you get to bigger towns. But, you know, coming from the Midwest, it, it, it still is not really like a cultural mecca. You know, like I hate to disappoint everyone, but like Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, like I'm sorry, not not real <laughs> cultural meccas. You know, um, they've got some cool stuff going on occasionally, but you know, as a kid, you're always looking at like Hollywood. You know, you're looking at L.A. and stuff like that, or looking at New York. So, when you see those cities and what they have to offer, and then you try to find something similar in your town, it's it's a little despairing. You know, it, it's 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 um it's difficult. You know, as a kid, so. You know, my mother was a big fan and we would stay up, you know, late at night and, you know, for three channels, they'd have midnight movies, you know, before the, the TV would go totally poltergeist and, and give you the stack and, and, and give you the national anthem. Um, yeah, like CBS would have midnight movies and stuff. And they were usually movies that they could get cheap. Um, and at the time, you know, there wasn't, I think, a big calling for like, you know, Hammer films, because I'm sure that they were just. Um, part of a back catalog of whatever network, you know, films that, you know, they had purchased at a time. So you can see stuff like, uh, you know, Satanic Rites of Dracula, Dracula, Prince of Darkness, you know, um, Horror of Dracula, you know, Twins of Evil, stuff like that. Like you could watch that shit at midnight, you know, on a network, which was kind of crazy, you know, even though it was a, you know, like a local network affiliate. So my mom and I would stay up and and some some of my best and most trusted traumatizing memories or staying up <laughs> to watch films I probably shouldn't have you know um you know, stuff like trilogy of terror with Karen Black and it being forever traumatized by that fucking Zuni fetish doll like, <laughs> like I got over that I was like 15 but you know looking back it it, it was something because like and, and this is something that I, I like to talk to people about because you know I think that pretty soon it's you know after like you and I are long gone it's gonna be you know, again, it's just going to be a story. You know, all these things really become legend after a while, you know, um, and that there's a ritual to stuff like that. There's this ritual aspect to staying up late at night, you know, with one of your parents that sort of, you know, sort of understood you better than the other one or, or you know, one that just sort of entertains your weird little interests. And, you know, we're not going to have that, you know, anymore. Um yeah, and, and, and unless somebody sets off some weird kind of, you know, like, uh, you know, electromagnetic device, and then we all go back to oh, know, right. <laughs> the prairie type. Um, but yeah, that, that's like weird stuff that we're going to lose that uh, kind of saddens me a little bit because I, I had some real connections, you know, in finding that, like I said, this idea of like a quest. I know I'm like just rambling on, but like the idea of, of quests, I think, are are something that horror and sci-fi fans maybe know a little bit better than than maybe you know uh, other people mm-hmm. because you know it was it was always searching for you know this this elusive thing that you know was the the next best movie that you were going to become a fan of or that that director you know that you didn't know had four previous movies and you became a fan and you're trying to find them and you know that stuff like uh, that still you know that that's kind of like there's i think there's a movie out there that you know that we should all make or we should come together and make that is you know the backdrop is like a horror collector in the 80s you know frantically searching for some movie that you know reportedly exists or something right hell yeah you know, I'm, similar, but. I'm, I'm in for that that's uh, kind of kind of some antrum vibes you know where it's like this movie's so haunted you're gonna die if you watch it you know have you seen that one <laughs> Yeah, and you know, and I, I kind of like love stuff like that. I kind of love just stories like that. You know, we've had several. Um, you know, I believe it was uh, what well, Masters of Horror had a uh, cigarette burns that sort of alluded to, yeah. you know, a movie that drove people insane. And that theme has been around for a really long time. Uh, like Robert Chambers, you know, The King in Yellow, like pre Lovecraft, 
yeah like chambers of king and yellow is a play that drove people mad so i think there's this idea of forbidden art that that sort of still has you know a, a bloodline sort of courses through horror and sci-fi that there's something out there that's mysterious and just sort of as, as deadly as the subject matter yeah it always interests me anyways oh yeah me too and dude i'm really glad that you you weren't rambling by the way that was <laughs> you <laughs> you were no you were totally hitting my nostalgia button because everything that you talked about staying up late you know i i didn't stay up late with my mom because my mom wasn't really into into horror movies so much like she she'd watch them my mom was pretty cool like she she would yeah. watch them but it wasn't really her thing plus uh, she was always kind of working late and stuff, so I was always home with my uncles. So I had, I had the stereotypical, you know, raised by the uncles kind of get the shit beat out of me on a nightly basis type thing. Not like all in good fun, like they weren't really beating the shit out of me, but it was oh, like, right. yeah. let's let let's hide outside and bang on the windows and scare the shit out of four year old Dustin. You know, that's oh yeah. Yeah, that that's the kind of uh, that's the kind of things that that I had. But it was the same thing. My uncles, um, as much as they tormented me, I can I can give them credit where credit is due. They are the ones that introduced me to horror. You know, um, we're you and I are about the same age. I think I'm in my I'm in my forties. You know, so I, I yeah. yeah. So I'm I'm yeah. an I'm an eighties kid. Um, yeah. So I I also remember pre cable days, you know, turning the turning the two knobs on the TV to, brrr, you know, um, the oh yeah the UHF and VHF, you know. Um, so I, I I remember that as well. And my uncles, that's where I was going with that. Is my uncles, they they introduced me to a Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the Thirteenth. Um, my favorite as a kid, I remember watching was how to the second story that was what's that uh, oh yeah I, I love the fact that bill maher is in that movie i know like, yeah that, young that, bill maher yeah. Yeah. yeah no but, but that movie i like almost every time i would get together with my uncles and they would babysit me or whatever and let's watch the i don't think i called it house because i didn't know any better at the time i called it i don't remember what i called it but i know it had something to do with the creepy old uh skeleton you know the the gunslinger character in the movie oh yeah 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 and that's i just i loved that guy i love that character so that's what got me into horror at a very young age um and i like I said, everything you mentioned, I remember doing, staying up late on the weekends when you weren't supposed to, you know, whether it be hanging out with your, your buddies at a, at a sleepover in their, you know, in their parents' basement or, or whatever. Oh, yeah. Those, I mean, those were, those were the best and the drive-in, like it's, it, it's, it's a shame that not a lot of people are, are going to get to know what a drive-in is. Like there's still some around. I don't know about in the Midwest where you're at, I know down here in Texas, there's still, there's still a few drive-ins, but yeah, they're, and maybe it's just me being biased because those were some of the best times when I was a kid. So maybe as an adult now, I'm like, ah, it's not the same, you know, cause it's, it, it doesn't have that same, doesn't have that same feel, you know, but, oh right, but they're yeah. still there, but it's, it is a shame that a lot of, you know, a lot of kids are going to grow up nowadays. Like you said, after we're long gone, a lot of kids are going to grow up and they, they might not know what that is. I mean, who knows where their enjoyment and nostalgia will come from. It, it might come from playing video games where ours came from watching horror movie, you know, who knows, but right, yeah. I, I just, I think, I think we're lucky to be alive at a time where that existed. And I think that it can still be carried on. I really do. And like you said about, you know, some filmmakers making a movie about that, like that, I think that's a fantastic idea and I support it a hundred percent. And I, because I, I'm all about bringing back nostalgia um, and I'm, I'm not going to sit here and plug my movie all night long because that's, that's not what we're here for. But in my movie, there is a, you know, I have a horror host in my movie, mm. you know, like the old, like Tales from the Crypt and the, you know, oh, yeah, Joe, yeah. Bob, Joe Bob Briggs and Sven Gulli and all those, you know, I I brought that into my first film because I wanted that. P whether people love it or hate it, I don't care. That was for me. It was because that's what yeah. I remember. You know, that to me, 
Friday night didn't start until I heard the Crypt Keeper laugh and tell some awful dad joke. You know that. Oh yeah. That that was my Friday night in middle school and high school. You know, as soon as you hear that cackle and he's telling these dad jokes, like someone's oh, someone's oh, about man, to have like a the, the intro. You know, that goes like through the stairs and the house yeah. and everything. Yeah. Like yeah, you know that that stuff again is, you know, something that we can't quite get back. Um, you know, we're in an age of binging. We're in this, you know, age of uh, we're, we're in an age of and strange, but like we're not necessarily bound by time anymore, which is sort of a weird concept when you start thinking about it. Like um, most of us really have sort of bizarre schedules when it comes to like entertainment, things of that nature, even like, you know, people who work from home, for example, you know, even that schedule is a little bit different now. You know, we're in the the age of flex time. And we're in the, uh, you know, the age of streaming and everything. So, I, you know, being younger, we were sort of dictated by time. You know, I, I, I knew when my favorite shows would come on. Yep. And that was always a benchmark to like the end of the week or the start of the weekend, you know, depending on what their slot was. So you were always sort of gauging time, you know, based on these interests. And I don't think we really you know, have that so much anymore. We, we do have, um, we do have some streaming services that release stuff on a weekly basis, which I actually really like. Like, I think I like that more than getting a whole season because, you know, I like being able to look over at my wife and be like, oh shoot, you know, Monday this drops. And it still has that feeling of what it was like when you had, you know, a prime time Friday show or something that you really liked. Yep. And I don't even know if, if primetime really sort of is a thing anymore. I, I know that the three major networks, you know, still sort of have it, but I don't think it means anything like what it used to mean, you know? Yeah. You know, no, you're right. right. I, I, I don't think it does. I don't think it has the same, the same meaning as it did when we were growing up. And there was, you know, uh, what was it? Uh, Family Matters and Full House and what TGIF, you know, like oh, yeah. that, that was, that was Friday night. You know, it's like Friday night, eight o'clock you knew exactly what was coming on and it's, you had, you had your night planned based on that. If that, you know, if that was your thing uh, that, yeah. Oh yeah. That, and yeah, nowadays it's, you're right. You, we really don't have that. I, I haven't made up my mind what I like more. If I like the, the binge or if I like to wait week by week, it, it kind of depends. Cause I, I do have some, some favorite shows out there. It's like, I agree with you where I, I like that feeling of, Okay, yeah, the, the new episode drops next Tuesday, but then the the kid inside me is like, "Come on, I just want to watch all of it. It's so good, you know." Oh, it can be painful. It can be almost <laughs> physically painful to have to wait for the show. I know I've I've got a couple right now that I that I really, really like, and um, knowing like that we're coming to the end of like the season on them, it's like, you know, it's this horrible dread that who knows if it'll be renewed, and if so. I mean, the way the writer strike has everything right now, we, we right. might not see our favorite show for another two years. Right. You know, it, it, it could be a lot. And that's kind of that's kind of weird because that was never really a thing in the heydays of network television. You know, you either got your new season. It was the fall lineup. Remember, I mean, I used yep. to scour the TV guide fall lineup to see what kind of genre shows were going to be on yep. each year. TV guy. And that was like how exciting was that that you you would have this fall lineup TV guide and like as a person that liked horror and sci-fi and stuff like you would just scour it you know to see what the new shows were going to be. Yeah. That was uh, an interesting feeling man. I, and and again like I don't think we really we we obviously don't have that because the way the shows are tiered and their release dates now. We right. don't have that huge influx which I think is kind of good because I mean, really, the fall lineup was just sort of like a 10 little Indians kind of thing. You know, they threw everything out there to see what was going to make it, you know, at, at probably midway through the season because there was always those midseason cancellations. And I'm kind of glad now that the competition is still there, but it's tiered a little bit. So smaller shows can sort of squeak by where right. I don't think they had any chance. And I mean, look at the amount of genre shows we have now compared to what it was like when we just had the three major networks. Yeah. You know, we were hungry for stuff, man, hungry. And then when something hit, like something really hit, like, 
you know, the X Files. It was like, you yep. know, people went insane over it mm-hmm. because there was so very little to attach yourself to. Not that the X Files wasn't a great show. I fucking love the X Files and I will still rewatch the X Files. I love that show. But um, it, it's obviously people either really attached themselves to something or, or, or they didn't. And there wasn't a whole lot of gray area there. It wasn't a sliding scale. It was either we have this and now it's successful or it's sort of, you know, eh, we don't really like it all that much. And, and then it's probably not going to be back for a second season. So yeah. it was much more, I think, black and white back then. But now we've got those shows that thankfully squeak by enough that they can get a following, you know, and then we get, you know, sometimes three or four seasons or, or more out of them. And, that's that's cool to me, and we we definitely are, in my opinion, in the golden age of television. I, I think we've got more shows, mm-hmm. genre shows, and well written shows, and well acted shows, and shows with higher production value than we've probably ever seen. Mm-hmm. Um, and and the way the model's going, I have a feeling it's probably going to be more than we'll ever see, because uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I think the amount of shows that we have is is, is on the decline. Yeah, I think you're right. And uh, for the kids out there, a TV guide was a book that we that we used to have to read to find out what was going to be on TV. <laughs> and it was newsprint. It was so at the end of reading that fall guide, your fingers were black yeah. from the newsprint of the TV guide. <laughs> yeah, so it was like it was a sacrifice you made. Yeah, right. To find out if there are any horror sci-fi shows. On. Right, and it was funny too because like it, it came. What did it come out by? Like the was it like by the month? You know, you could go buy like a monthly thing at the grocery store in line. And oh yeah, it, I, I think they had one that was like a magazine format. And then they had like the weekly format, which was the small ones. Right. But but it was crazy because that was also in, in the age too, where you had all those like soap opera digests, you know, where yep. all of those were in the uh, the impulse section at the checkout lanes. Yep. And, and what do we have now? I think two, two soap operas, maybe. That's maybe. it. Out of all the networks, I think we've got two. And there was one point where it was something like, I think, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m every major network was nothing but hour long soap operas that's something that a generation you know ahead of us is going to be like what yep what in the world is a soap opera <laughs> yeah and that's kind of crazy it is i just remember reading the tv guide as a kid going how do they know you know like it's oh, right yeah. it's like saturday they know what's going to be on tv on saturday how do they know that cuz like you said there, there was no internet back then i mean maybe there was a little bit but it wasn't you know it was you yeah. couldn't just google something you know it was the tv guide was like the industry insider <laughs> right yeah it was like it was, every every grandma had one on the coffee table it, oh yeah it, yeah I, know, I i think i've still got because I'm a huge fucking nerd. I think I've still got like every TV guide that had Lord of the Rings covers on it. Oh wow. So, <laughs> somewhere. Like in a in a in, you know in a bin or you know, some kind of plastic tote or something. I'm sure I've got something like that. Wow. That would be that would be cool to see. I don't I don't have anything cool like that, unfortunately. You said nerd. I'm like, that's the coolest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, at one point in time, like I just, I, I I went through like phases, like before, like before my divorce, I'm, I'm remarried now, but my first marriage I, it ended badly, and um, a lot of my collectibles and stuff, unfortunately, um, sort of went the way of the dodo, um, and a lot of Ooh. stuff that I had that I'll probably never be able to get back. A lot of them I'm still trying, and I pick up stuff probably I pr- pick up probably way too much stuff than I should. But I'm always like scouring online marketplaces because occasionally somebody will find something like in a barn somewhere, which yep. is kind of cool about being in the Midwest. I've got a a, a 19, got is 78 or 79 uh, Shogun Warrior Godzilla. And uh, it was a barn find uh, in a town about 20 miles away from here. Somebody found it in a barn and posted wow. it. And I'm like, I cannot believe that that was, you know, just. And a barn somewhere. There's a few like masters, universe figures and stuff in there. So, so yeah. So I finally got a uh, uh, 
Shogun Warrior Godzilla been wanting like, ever since I was a, a kid. <laughs> and some other stuff that occasionally like I'll stumble upon. Like you can't see it here, but I've got a uh, you know a 1979 Kenner alien, one of the 18 inch aliens, and mm-hmm. you know the back of the head you can push, and the you know second set of jaws yeah. will come out. Yeah, it's I love that thing. But that's another thing too that like took me years and years to pull the trigger on because those were like fairly expensive and yeah. you know i i'm like i i, I come from a, like if not a horribly poor background but i come from a background where those sort of purchases were always frivolous mm-hmm. it, it, and you know so a, as unfortunately you get into an adult like some of those habits are still there yep. where you're like i can't spend this much money on this i can't because <laughs> you have to sort of rewire yourself in order to make yourself happy or yeah. else you just become this person that sits back and, 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 you know, won't let yourself have anything. So that was one of the few bucket list items that was like, Oh, come on. Yeah. Oh, you're an old man. Now, Ash, you can buy yourself toys. <laughs> <laughs> you can buy that toy if you want to, nobody can stop you. Right. You can do it. Ash. You can do it. <laughs> Give myself a fucking pep talk at three o'clock in the morning on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah, I didn't have uh, I didn't have the luxury of growing up around barns or anything. I'm I'm in Texas now, not native. I'm originally from the West Coast in Washington State. I grew up in uh, in Tacoma, Washington. It's about 40 minutes south of Seattle. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's where I grew up. So not a lot of not a lot of barn finds around there. You might find some you know guitar picks from Kurt Cobain thrown around. And, <laughs> Yeah, there. Yeah, you never know. Yeah, there. Uh, there was some. Yeah. There's some pretty cool stuff up there. I mean, I. You know, it's it's a great place. It's too expensive to live nowadays, but it's a great place. And I I gotta say, growing up, I I did have the pleasure of getting to to see a lot of cool things from that area. You know, a lot of the great bands that I still love: Nirvana, oh, yeah. Soundgarden, Alice in Chains. You know, I'm I'm a I'm a rock and metal guy, so that was that was really cool to grow up in that that area um and but speaking of like movies and things i remember going to see blair witch when it first came out in like what was it 98 and it was only in select theaters we had to drive up to seattle to some creepy and i mean they couldn't have picked a better location to play this thing too because it was it was like a gothic theater i mean it had like gargoyles out front like it was oh wow that's pretty cool yeah it was it was a creepy ass place we drove all the way up there to see the thing got inside watched it and then walked out and we're like that fucking sucked you know because we didn't we didn't appreciate it at the time you know right now of course it's you know that movie's it's it's like the goat it's you know, it's, oh, yeah. it's, it's it's not the original found footage, obviously, but it it's one of the more mainstream, more popular ones that, you know, that kind of set the ball in motion for folks like yourself and me and Dylan Brown and, you know, all these wonderful, freaking awesome filmmakers out there now. Like that's that movie kind of set the ball in motion. I think it came at like just the right time. I mean, we were just sort of getting into the age of the internet, you know, and people were, um, you know, adopting the internet, you know, and what it represented was that weird sort of gateway where, you know, it, there wasn't enough people online to truly like, you know, um, to destroy the mystery around it, you know, there, Mm -hmm. you know, the gig wasn't up, like people realized, uh, you know, that it was, you know, probably fake because usually it's something that's too good to be true. You know what I mean? It, it would right. have been a, like a, a smoking gun for the paranormal if that was the case. But, um, you know, there was just enough like legitimacy of, you know, people getting scared, people talking about it, rumors being spread that I, I think it also sort of blew the doors wide open for a lot of amateur filmmakers because it was one of those first films that people really started talking about, uh, the the success of extremely low budget yep. the success of of homegrown cinema the success of being able to do something with a very limited cast and crew and very limited resources you know although years later we find out that they had more money than we actually thought they did and, right you know there was a whole lot going on there that was you know on the promotional back end that we mm-hmm. were really privy to but it did at least start setting that precedent where people started talking about 
the accessibility of indie film for filmmakers. Because, you know, prior to that, even if it was a small film, it was still a film shot on film. You know, it was still a film that had to go through all the rigmarole of finding studios that were willing to represent it and, you know, uh, sort of classical distribution and then theatrical runs. And, you know, being in the 90s, it was able to take advantage of not only theatrical, but, you know, the the blockbuster model and all that, like it was really for that film it was like the you know the perfect storm you know it's unfortunate but uh you know we really don't have that kind of jumping off point anymore you know like we we don't really have a lot of um i guess like uh you know like unfertilized territory you know virgin territory Uh, you know a lot of what we have is literally just hoping it it reaches the right person you know hoping it reaches the right people um, hoping then that, you know, word of mouth and, you know, the number of streams, you know, is, you know, is something that will elevate the film and, you know, then you can make another one, another one, another one. Um, but yeah, it was a, a, a different time, man. Um, like, again, you know, we're talking nostalgically, but it's like, there, there is room for nostalgia in a lot of that. I mean, I mean, I'm not, necessarily a cynic like i'm I'm not jaded by any means but you know like a, a filmmaker in our time is is really strange because we have all of these tools available to us um that weren't available to us you know let's face it 45 years ago right you know 45 years ago if you wanted to make a film you, you better have at least a hundred thousand dollars you know and that was just to to, to get it rolling yep um you know, now we've got some fantastic stuff that's shot on iPhones. We've got fantastic stuff that's edited on iPhones. We've got, you know, a lot of really, really creative people out there, which of course sort of like hyper saturates the market, you know, so you've got people that are releasing films all the time. And it's, I, I, I do feel like it's maybe not so competitive, especially, you know, sort of like, you know, in the horror market, because I think a, a lot of people are very, a nice and accommodating and i feel like there's really a brotherhood here mm-hmm. um and i think that that's a, that's a great thing um but yeah it's a definitely a different time and i think that sadly um the kinks are still sort of being worked out as far as how our films reach the public yeah and um like i'll i'll be the first person to say that like i don't think the model works and i don't think that you know, filmmakers are really making the money they deserve. And, you know, I think the, I think unfortunately the, the model still works like the blockbuster model worked, you know, which was you have a movie that finds distribution and, you know, then blockbuster buys 10 tapes at 99 99 so that they can rent them. Um, and then all of a sudden you've got a thousand dollars and one out of five blockbusters in a town of 50,000 people. And there are a lot of 50 to 100 to 200,000 to, you know, all these towns across the United States. You had a lot of people that had direct to video movies that were shot for next to nothing. Yep. And these people are still making money off of those movies, you know, because of that model. You know, I think that that was a great time to be a filmmaker. You know, if, if unfortunately, if you had a little bit of money and you had some means, you could probably make a film that would tide you over until your next film. Um, And that's not necessarily the case now, you know, unfortunately um, I just don't think, I don't think we know how to do it yet. You know, I I think that a lot of people are still very enthusiastic about making films. You know, I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about it. You're very enthusiastic about it. A lot of our colleagues or peers are. Um, But when it really comes to, getting our film out there and, and and let's face it like getting paid um it's just not that easy um we're we're making people money that's for sure like somebody's getting paid right you know the entertainment market is wide enough that there's enough room for these films because everyone wants content everybody's scrambling for content but um you know let's face it like the content creators aren't really 
unfortunately getting getting paid the way that they should and that's that's kind of sad so it, you know there's i think there's an evolution yet that's going to you know put us where we need to be but but i think that we're we're definitely you know there, there there's a struggle right now to find a foothold on it right yeah and you're you're not the first person to to bring up that concern either you know i, I have talked to other filmmakers that have said the same thing about somebody's getting paid but it's not you know it's it's not us and i don't i don't know how i feel about that yet because i'm still you know i'm still new to the game i've only got my one film in distribution right now and it hasn't even gone fully live yet but it's i i can see where like okay so like let's let's just say your film for instance holes in the sky the sean miller story um speaking of Blair Witch and having you know being the goat um I if I got my information correct at last read you now have the record for most awards for a found footage film at is it 19 now or is it more well uh Blair Witch came in at 19 um 19 or 18 I believe and and we were really not um like I, I get really weird when like I try to, to give like pep talks. I'm like the worst. I can never be like a football coach or anything because uh, I'm I'm always like the low hanging fruit estimate kind of guy. Right. So instead of like go out there and kill them, go out there and rip their heads <laughs> off. I'm, I'm I'm more like, hey, give it your best. If you get hurt, don't play. Come on back. We'll talk about things. <laughs> you know, I'm, I I think I take more of like a. Uh, like a therapist approach. And, you know, when we first, we first put the movie out, you know, I told people, I said, yeah, we're going to try to put it in a few festivals. And, you know, and I talked to the cast and, you know, what little crew we had. And I said, you know, but if it doesn't get in, that's okay. You know, I'm like, you know, sometimes these places have 3000 movies. Mm -hmm. Like if we don't get in, it's because there's a lot of good movies out there, you know, but the fact that we tried is pretty cool. And and then we started to get into these festivals. And then I was like, okay. So th then I then I ramped up my low expectations pep talk, which was like, don't expect to win anything. <laughs> <laughs> we just got in, and that's that's enough. So I was always really weird about uh, stuff like that, and I sort of always have been. I and I don't exactly know why, but I'm always sort of uh, uh, I, I I always have expect expectations of a rug being pulled out from under me. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds weird. But it's always like every time we won an award, I expected a follow up phone call to say that it was a mistake. You know, I was always expecting like that email, like, we're very sorry to inform you. Yeah. <laughs> a film by a very similar name was actually the film. That <laughs> and then I'd have to go back and renege on every single thing that I did and be like, I'm so sorry, guys. We actually didn't. Win a few <laughs> like, I, 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 like, that was the stuff that honestly went through my head. And it's really like it's not for like lack of confidence because I'm a fairly confident guy. Um, but I, I think it's just maybe it's a generational thing, you know, of mm -hmm. you know, Charlie Brown getting the football pulled out, you know, you know, from under him when he's trying to kick it and stuff like that. You know, they're always sort of expecting that that next thing to happen. But you know, we were in the car and my and my my wife was looking and she's like, Hey, I think that you know, like Blair Witch is like, you know, 19 is, is, is what they won. And I was like, oh, that's, I'm like, that's pretty cool. And she's like, like, where are we at? And like, I didn't want to have the conversation. I'm like, oh no, I don't even like, this is, you know, you, you jinx yourself. I'm not doing this, mm -hmm. you know, all, all of a sudden, like, I'm, you know, like phobic, I'm like, oh no, no, we can't talk about this. And, and we were, we were pretty close. Like we were pretty close. Um, and I'm like, okay, well, you know, let's not make this a thing. Like, I can't make it a thing. Like, I can't think about it. Um, and then we got a few more, <laughs> and we and we sort of tipped over the edge there. And and now I think at total we're at like 28. So I think we wow a few more than like what you know we were sort of maybe hoping for because of the Blair Witch thing. So yeah, we ended up hitting like a lot, and then occasionally some will like still come through that we just totally either forgot about or we'll have people ask us if you know is it okay to show the film and is it okay to to enter it you know in the festival because we're going to show it and, mm -hmm. you know 
the one that I really want to go to that's coming up over the 4th of July is that they're showing it in Roswell. And I yeah. really, really want to go. And I've been to Roswell, and, and I love Roswell. I love the Roswell area, actually. So I'm, I'm kind of miffed that this is the one that I can't go to. It's like we've just – it's just not something we can do right now. You know, the, the distance oh. and it being around the 4th and, you know, like have, having a kid. Um, is always something where you gotta sort of look at what you can and can't do. But right. that is one that I would have loved to have uh, been at the screening for. It's the Roswell one. So yeah, I mean, especially considering the, you know, the premise of the movie. It's it's about alien abduction and it, the festivals in Roswell. Like that, man. Yeah, it's it's perfect. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it, it is. But I, oh, yeah, okay. Well, I, I, I won't, I won't dig into that sore spot because, man. <laughs> um, but okay, so you were at like twenty eight awards. Holy shit! I, I had no idea it was that many. I knew that you now have, you know, more awards for that movie than any other found footage. Which congratulations, by the way. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Well, well deserved. I. Every, you know, every time I've commented on something on Facebook or even just personally messaged you, like I've, I've meant every word. And I just want you to know that from just not just, a you know, as a as a fan or even a, you know, hopeful colleague one day. It's it literally like that movie. The first time I watched, I watched it before it was out on Tubi and all that. I, I rented it on uh was it Voodoo or Amazon? I don't remember, but I rented it on one of them. It was. And, and thank you for renting it, too. Um because that helps. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, 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 that's what I've heard. Yeah, I think it was, I think it was Voodoo. I rented it on. It was like five bucks or something. And I'm like, you know, at the time, because I, I had never, I had never heard of the movie. I'd never heard of you. You know, I, I'm, I'm a found footage fan. I always have been. But it was just one of those things where it's like people are just starting to talk about it in Facebook groups, and I'm, I'm hearing how good it is. And I, I, I made a little you know, a, a little, it was, it was some B roll in my movie, but it was, it was honest truth about my favorite kinds of found footage are cryptid and alien found footage. Um, so then I, I read, of course I Googled it and I read about what your film was about and I'm like, Oh shit, it's alien abduction. Like I'm in, I don't care if this thing's 30 bucks. Like I'm in. Cause I, I, I've been into aliens since I can remember, you know? Um, and the, the way you did it and I, you know, I won't go into your budget or anything, but talking about, you know, people being able to do things on a limited budget. I mean, my God, dude, like what you did with that movie was such a limited budget. And I, I don't, it's hard for me to even describe how it made me feel the first time I watched it because I was, it was kind of all the emotions. I was creeped out. I was, I was nervous. I was happy. I was sad because of, you know, and I won't spoil it, but because of some things that happened in the movie and your performance, right. I was like, that's so sad. You know, like it, it literally hit like all the feels and I, it's, it's no bullshit when I, I, I told you I've watched the thing four times. Like that's, that's God's honest truth. I, I have watched your movie four times because I just, I enjoy it that much and i that's just something that i wanted to tell you personally that for me your film holds a very special place in my heart because i i really really enjoyed the shit out of that movie um and so every every award you're getting all the accolades you're getting for it, everything you're getting is in my opinion fucking well deserved thank you thank you thank you very much like that that does act, that does actually mean a lot you know um it's 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 difficult putting yourself out there you know it it, it really is even though like you know I, I had produced a couple films i had done a couple short films and um doing horror fix and stuff i i had some fantastic opportunities to talk to people in the industry so i've always sort of <coughs> hovered around it you know but to be able to say like i'm, I'm gonna take this idea and you know and then that's why i hand it to anybody who does it. honestly it is a huge endeavor to say i'm going to take something i'm going to make something that that i want that i want to see that i that i want to put out there and then i'm going to put it out there because the you know the world will scrutinize it like i'm, I'm not you know 
and and again like i never want to come across as being like cynical or jaded like i'm very very happy to have made anything to have done anything but you know it does put you in a position where you know you got to be really thick skinned definitely you've got to be mm-hmm. thick skinned um so you know when people do enjoy it that's that that counterweight and and often one person can enjoy it and to me you know i i count that as as having much more value than 20 people who don't right um because that that that's what i want i i want somebody to watch it and to be able to get something even if it's just just enjoyment even if they just watched it and was like oh that was an hour and a half of my life that i don't regret <laughs> spending on that you know it's like okay success i i entertained somebody you know for an hour and a half cuz you know sort of in in this world in this day and age an hour and a half to be able to 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 take a step back from whatever reality you're in, even if it's a great reality that still has its pitfalls and its obstacles, but to be able to be entertained, to be entertained to a degree where you live vicariously through characters for better or worse, and you have that escape, like an hour and a half escape is is a pretty amazing thing, you know, to either give somebody or or give yourself or whatever. So, no, seriously, like I I can't thank you enough for for enjoying it and letting me know about it. Cause you know, that that's the intent, you know, I, I want mm-hmm. to entertain people and you know, if I can keep entertaining people, then that's going to be good. You know, like that's sort of what I always set out to do is like, I have a story that I really like and, you know, hopefully I can convey in a way that, uh, you know, somebody else can attach themselves to it and go, Oh, okay. I understand that. Or, Oh, I get that. Or, Oh, I feel that. Or, Oh, that creeped me out, you know, or whatever. Like, if I can elicit a tiny little emotion, you know, that adds to that whole idea of escapism. So, yeah, that, well, you, you, you nailed it. I'm just going to tell you that you nailed it. Um, it was, it was easy to spend that hour and a half, um, it invested in that film because it, it, it had, it had everything as far as I'm concerned. It was, it was super creepy at times. Um, and it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like an in-your-face jump scare type of creepy. It was, you know, you you your subtlety and a lot of the things you did in that movie was fantastic. So, uh, the the scene in the field with the, you know, I, I mean, I just, well, you know, I I still watch that. Scene. Like I know what's going to happen, and I still get goosebumps because it's just, I, I don't know, I I don't know what it is about that scene in particular, but that scene is just, it gives me goosebumps watching it, and I've seen it four times, so it. You, yeah. you know, I, I, I wanted to do something during the daylight mm-hmm. and, and and so we're like okay so I wanted to and I didn't want to I wanted to because I thought wow if, if I can have a creepy element and not only like broad daylight but, but a sunny day that people are you know eating outside and, and they're having a good time like if you can make that creepy I'm thinking wow that would you know I could really sort of elevate you know the tone of the film doing that and then there was a part of me that's like what the hell do you think you're doing like don't try to do that <laughs> just stick the stuff at night it's so much easier but now I'm, I'm glad that and when we were go back watching you know some of the footage we were like oh this works like this mm-hmm. does work it's sort of uh you're just not expecting to see that out there and i i'm always a person where it's it's like i think it's that stuff sometimes in the periphery or the stuff in the distance sometimes that that scares me you know yeah. when i watch films where you know, it's just a little bit off center. It's a little bit blurry. You can't really see it, you know, and especially, you know, from a ufological perspective or even a, a, a cryptid perspective, you know, that's 99% of the evidence we have is is blurry photos and blurry videos. And I, I sort of wanted to do that. I, I'm like, well, I can't, you know, give anybody a smoking gun. We can get as close as we can but we got to put some stuff in the periphery. We got to make sure that it's a little bit obscured, um, not only from a budgetary perspective, but just because to, to me, that was, that's part of realism is this is the evidence that we see. This is when we go online, this is what we see. Mm-hmm. So our brain sort of fills in those gaps naturally and says, oh, this is the way it is because most of this stuff turns out blurry yep. or off center or in the distance, or we just can't quite put our finger on it or we can't keep it in frame or whatever. I mean, there are a lot of scenes that look too slick for me because the way we shot it. And I was like, I, I got to get one. Fuck this up. So <laughs> it's, it's too clear. It'll never work. 
<laughs> it's like it gives way too much away. You know, it's it's funny because, and I don't know if I've really talked about this this much, but there was a a, a part in the film <clears throat> towards towards the end where, you know, a, as a complete you know idiot, I go outside because there's something out there. And I want to get a better look at it because, you know, my character, me, is filming this documentary. Mm -hmm. And we did a few things to try to get this look for that thing that was out there. And the one thing that I wanted to almost make it look like is I, I wanted to make it look like it was sort of organic and almost sort of robotic at the same time. Like it, it almost had the, like this LED sort of quality to it. You know, there was stuff that was glowing and stuff. And I actually spent about three weeks on this special effect of I'm running in and I look up and the thing is like directly above me. Mm -hmm. And I did this whole CGI thing where we had a, it, it sort of was, was a face that was one of the actors. And then it sort of transformed into something not so human and, and back and forth. Like it was trying to grab onto an image and, and it couldn't quite do it. So it was sort of, you know, it was like, it, it, it was running like a, a, a loop of errors trying to, to, to fix itself and, and mm -hmm. have this sort of this image. And I spent so much time on it, man. Like I spent, cause I did the special effects. I did, you know, the way it comes when you're an indie filmmaker, you like you're Jack of all, you know, you wear so many hats that you're, you're up to four o'clock in the morning doing all this stuff. And, um, you know, I was doing the CG for it and I was doing all of these animations and everything for it. And I spent like a solid three weeks on this because it was like, I really wanted this like money shot of this thing, you know, and I, and I got it done and I just fucking hated it. Like I couldn't stand it. I put it in the movie and I was like, Oh, what am I doing? Like, I just looked at it. And I was like, Oh, this is horrible. And like, and everybody else was like, no, it actually, it looks good. And I'm like, well, I don't care about that. Yeah. <laughs> like, like it doesn't work. Like it just doesn't work here. And that was like one thing that was like sort of disappointing was because you get an idea and sometimes you get fixated on that and you just, you, there's something you might want to show. You're like, I really want to show this. And like, I really wanted to show that. Like there was a whole subplot. Like I had so much footage for this thing, Dustin, it was stupid. <laughs> like at one point in time, we actually sat down and we're like, we think we've got enough for like, this is, this is how much shit we shot. At one point in time, I said, I think we've got enough for six one hour episodes. Damn. Like, I think we've got enough that we could actually do a series. Like I was, and, and then like, I sat there and then I thought to myself, like, I don't know how the hell to do a series. Like, I don't know even who to present this to or or anything like i was just struck with that thought that it was like okay you're making a movie that's sort of you know put, putting you in a place you haven't really been in before making a full-length feature and now on top of it you want to make a series i'm like this is just you're out of your depth you don't know what you're doing <laughs> so there was a lot of stuff that weird little subplots and stuff that was supposed to run through the course of like you know these episodes like strangely i was a much bigger asshole and the other footage oh, like, yeah. i guess in full i was just an insane jerk <laughs> and and some, and some of it worked really well and some of it didn't and you know by the time like we sat down it was like i don't think we can like you know we've got enough but we don't know who to call about this like we don't know how to go about marketing a, a series or anything like that you know we just we just didn't know what we were doing really having that much footage you know and that was when we decided like no 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 we'll go ahead and go back to the idea of, of just making it a movie and then of course it was super long and uh i had a cut that was like two hours wow <laughs> that, <laughs> that actually ran at a few festivals and i was surprised that that one actually ran at a few festivals and then like we had a uh so I, so I will say that we had a conversation uh, with a guy that works for a company that sounds a lot like Retflix. Okay. <laughs> and at some point in time, there was some interest expressed. And uh, 
the first piece of advice that I got was, is, hey, how fast can you trim a half an hour off of this? Uh, I was like, oh, this thing that I've been editing for months and months? <laughs> um, is Monday okay? Because <laughs> I hate myself, and I'm going to try to do this in 48 hours. <laughs> so, yeah, there's, 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 there's a cut that's like two plus hours long, and then, you know, over the course of like a weekend, we trimmed it to an hour and 36 which even then they were like well technically we'd like an hour and 28 minutes but yeah didn't matter anyways because that place that rhymes with Netflix didn't pick it up so didn't pick it up damn it well i i would have watched the series i would have watched the two hour cut the four hour cut i would have watched it all just so you know <laughs> um i think i had the two hour cut somewhere if you want i'll, I'll send you a link to it oh man that'd be great i would i, I would watch the hell out of that i really would because yeah it's it's that good of a movie, and I, I could fanboy over holes all night long. I could, but I I won't put you through that. I promise. Um, <laughs> I know you you've got a schedule to keep, um, but I do want to talk about a couple of more things that you've got coming up real quick. Um, one being uh, Eft Tales from the End Times. That is next year. I think twenty twenty four is when that's slated for a release. Yeah, that's when I think it's going to be like out in the wild. I'm hoping that if everything um, sort of goes according to schedule, that we'll be in festivals later this year. Um, that's kind of what I'm aiming for. Um, we'll see because it's a it's a much uh, bigger project than um, I think what I originally intended. Um, these things happen sometimes where you're like, yeah, I want a scene with a hundred extras in it. And then all of a sudden you're like, why did I do this to myself? <laughs> um, like, especially like in the editing room, you're like, why, why did I do it? But um, yeah. So we, we've got this horror anthology. I'm always a big fan of the anthologies, a big fan of creep show, a mm -hmm. uh, big fan of um, it, even the, the serial anthologies like tales from the dark, dark side, uh, you know, Laurel's monster, stuff like that. So um, I wanted to do an anthology because I've, I've always enjoyed them. I like this idea of different visions in, in one movie. So, um, you know, I do the, the wraparound story and, and which leads into the end segment. And then we have a, a Dylan Brown, uh, you know, Tahoe Joe and, and soon to be ghost fame who is uh, doing one of the segments, uh, Josh Brucker, who did Mothman and working on uh, Woodsman. Uh, he did a segment, um, which I've already seen, and it's great. Um, and Ben Harl, who is a documentary filmmaker, his documentary Afterlife is coming out later this year, and it is a, a brilliant, brilliant examination of people's views on life after death and, uh, you know, people who even sort of a experiment to get there. It's some really interesting, interesting stuff that he's done. And his segment, he's already wrapped principle for it. And, um, and, and then we have John Iceberg, who directed uh, Final Summer, which is doing really, really well in the festival circuit right now. It's just sort of an 80s uh, slasher throwback. Um, so we've got four fantastic directors, and, and then myself as a director doing um, the, the rapper and the end segment and I shot mine. Now it's crazy thinking about it. Like I shot mine over a month ago. Um, and we're still just editing, 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 editing. Cause, um, what I wanted to do is I definitely wanted to do something different than what I had done before. Um, cause holes is sort of a, a slower burn and it's, uh, it's a little more of a methodical piece. And, you know, I, I liked that that movie does have the ability to sort of creepy and it's sort of, you know, wears on you after a while. And this, um, I decided to do the complete opposite and like things get underway very, very quickly. And, um, it's, I think it definitely falls more under, uh, action horror, uh, than, than anything else. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's five stories that all take place. Uh, on the same day in the same universe, it just so happens that it's the day the world ends. So 
it's uh, different instances of what's happening on this this global scale. And I, and I will say that it's it is a supernatural world ending. So we get some nastiness and there's a whole lot of blood and uh you know people definitely go out more with a, a bang than a, a whimper and a, and a lot of uh, a lot of the things that we had planned a lot of things that we we shot so yeah we're hoping to get that in the festival circuit probably come september when everybody's part is done and hopefully mine will be done the post-production is uh pretty hefty um and then uh i'm actually shooting another full feature uh starting in november and hopefully i'm going to get that done before the first of the year and i'll have that edited hopefully for a late 24 release so i'm hoping that i get the anthology for an early global release in 24 and then the the other feature in late uh late 2024 okay okay well, yeah, Eft, it, just from what you've told me of it, I, I, I don't know, other than what you just said, I don't know anything about it really. And now I, now that I got the, the general idea of it being an apocalyptic, you know, inner, intertwined anthology, I'm, I'm super stoked about it. And I appreciate you sharing that info. So now, if, you know, the, the three other people that are listening to my podcast are going to get stoked about this thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it sounds it it sounds absolutely badass and I do know Dylan Brown I do know not personally I haven't met them but I you know we're we've become pretty pretty close on Facebook and everything so Dylan and Josh Brucker I've talked to them they provided a lot of advice such as yourself on on my movie so that yeah, I do know those two the other two you mentioned I, I I don't know that I've heard of but the way you described them, it sounds like they're going to be great additions to this thing. Um, so it's, it's five stories. Are they all like 20 minute segments? Are we looking at about an hour and a half, two hour thing or. Yep. Yeah, right, right around there. Um, Josh just comes in right around 20. Um, I, I basically told everyone or, you know, and, you know, uh, mentioned to everyone like 20 is pretty much our sweet spot. You know, if we have, five at 20 that puts us at a pretty good run time you know and if we're mm -hmm. a few minutes off here or there that's fine um mine has come in longer unfortunately so <laughs> we're trying to try to see what we can do there but um you know ah, it's a little bit over it's a little bit over but um yeah so you're you're gonna get you know five pretty like um you know well-contained stories that are sort of again all taking place in the same universe and and all on the same day. So you might see some connective tissue, you know, between these stories. Um, you know, there might be little Easter eggs and stuff in there, you know, that uh, people might find. And, and, and strangely, there might be some, there might be some holes in the sky, Easter eggs. Oh, okay. Because te technically, technically my film takes place in the same, the same universe. My part of the film takes place in that same the same universe where that incident happened. So, ah, okay. Okay. Well, shit, man. Um, okay. So F somewhere around 24. Okay. Um, got some great people working on that with you. I'm super stoked about that. Now you did mention that you've got a board game coming out as well with, yeah, we've had that in the works for a while. Um, it's it's an undertaking. All this stuff is an undertaking, you know. Um, uh, I I've I've always been that kind of person where it's like if if I can eliminate a learning curve and do something myself just to get something moving, you know, I'll try to do that. Um, so a lot of the artwork is my artwork. Um, I had had a friend who was a big gamer that I consulted and was like, hey, you know, like I need to make this work. <laughs> like, you know, I've got an idea. And what I, what I really wanted was I, I wanted a game that played like a horror film. Mm -hmm. um, and it plays like a different horror film every time. Okay. So the game itself, um, you can play a, you know, an occult character. Or you can play a psychopath. You can play, if you want to play the villain, we've got a slew of villains that luckily um, you might recognize because parody law is a little fast and loose. Sometimes you can get away with uh, 
you know, because no, nobody's got a trademark on just a hockey mask, let's face it. So right. we can get away with a little <laughs> bit by doing stuff like that. Nobody's got a trademark on just dolls or killer dolls. So you can get sort of close. Uh, so let's say if you wanted to play a character that was similar to a cinematic character like Jason Voorhees or a cinematic character like Chucky or a cinematic character like Freddy Krueger, there's there's a character that has some of those attributes that'll sort of satisfy um, your want to do that. And it's sort of a 3D game. So you get these little stand-up characters. Um, it's 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 interesting to me, anyways, because you blind draw the board. Like the board isn't laid out in front of you. You actually draw a tile, you flip the tile over, and that tile represents a room. So if you're a killer, for example. The point of the game is is you set a body count at the beginning of the game. So let's say four or six, depending on how long you want the game to run, is going to be your body count. So whoever gets six makes it back to home base. They win the game. So the thing that I really like about it is that, again, it plays like a horror film. When you go into that room, you have certain glowing items that represent a bed, a closet, so you look to find victims because they can be hiding anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, so you roll once you get the amount of spaces you need to, to reach a bed or a closet or a chest or whatever. And then you roll some dice to, to see what you find in there. And um, you might find a weapon. So if it says you grab a weapon, then you blind draw a card from what we call the tool shed. And you might find a machete. You might find night vision um binoculars you might find a kevlar vest all the stuff that you can equip your character with so you can have sort of five of these cards and five of any real kind of card you can have a weapon you can have what's called a plot twist that might play on any character on the board it might play on every character but you have a, a hand of up to five cards that you can use to augment your character so you have hit points similar to like you're playing dungeons and dragons or something mm-hmm. so it's got a lot of familiar elements of games because you can't just get a victim. You have to find a victim, right? The victims fight back in this and they're everything from a high school principal to an alcoholic parent, to a baby in a basket, to (laughs) a high school cheerleader. Like they're all the horror tropes Mm -hmm. about every movie you've seen. Um, And we, and we've got some stuff that's, really cool that sort of plays like every card is supposed to play like a horror movie so if you don't want to play as a psychopath maybe you want to play as a zombie so we've got a playable character that's a zombie and the cool thing about the zombie is is that every time you kill a person your stats increase so that you eventually have a zombie horde so they're slower than the other characters but once you have mass victims they're very difficult to stop so if anybody plays a zombie you want to stop them almost automatically because as soon as they get victims they're like a force to be reckoned with so they're sort of like a horde of zombies yeah wow okay well yeah so it it definitely i i can feel some D &D vibes there the way you described it you said it there's kind of some dungeons and dragons elements to it now with with it being a different experience every time you play so is this obviously it's a multiplayer game is it is there a certain limit of players that can play this thing? Is it like D and D where you could play it? Like one game can last you 12 hours if you wanted it to. It's, it's meant to last anywhere from about 45 minutes to about three hours. It's okay. sort of like where, where we've placed it. Um, that doesn't mean that it couldn't last longer. I mean, we've got some things planned for like expansion decks, mm-hmm. for example, so right now, every room represents like an old house. It looks mm-hmm. like an old, you know, sort of haunted house with blood on the floor. And you can go into the sections that are libraries. There's kitchens. There's bathrooms. So you can investigate this entire house as either a killer or a potential victim. Um, the, the neat thing about it is, is that there is room for co-op if you really want to. Um, and there are times where you absolutely have to fight an opponent. So a, a lot of times you might wait for somebody to get their six victims and then you might stalk them across the board in hopes that you can fight them and get their victims and then, and then win the game. Oh, wow. um, 
so there's a whole lot of like little pieces of strategy in there and just like their cinematic counterparts a lot of the the, the, the character cards are very similar to what their licensed characters are able to do in films so if you've got let's say we've got a character called murder doll which does resemble a red-haired doll of a very popular horror movie franchise mm -hmm. so if you're that character and you get within about two spaces of another character you can actually roll to possess them for a number of turns so you can actually then have that other character <laughs> fight for you um we have characters that can uh, attack from three and four spaces away. Some have to be right in your space. So we've tried to do as much as possible so that anyone that e even hasn't watched a horror film can come in and play it. Now, if you have watched horror films and you like horror films, there is a component that will give you a huge edge. And that is throughout the game are these traps that are scattered. So you can't really avoid them. Um, if you roll and you cross one of them, you have to sort of roll to get out of the trap. And if you roll and your roll is too low, then points are taken off because you have to, you know, get scathed or hurt to get out of the trap. Mm -hmm. Now, you do have an alternative to actually answer a horror trivia question uh, as well. Okay. So we've got a whole deck of trivia cards that come with the game. So there's the ability to have an edge if you are a horror fan. So we did want to make horror fans, you know, have just that, that tiny little bit of an edge over a normal player where if you know your horror trivia and, you know, you, you want to get through this with as little points taken off as possible, then you're, you're definitely going to have an advantage. Wow. Man, you're a busy guy. Like, <laughs> that. <laughs> That sounds amazing, and I kind of wish I lived in Illinois now because I would like to play that game. That sounds really, that sounds really badass, man. That really does. So, is yeah. that you did mention you're looking for a manufacturer for that? Like, is that something you can talk about? Do you have any? Like, is there something lined up, or is it still kind of just in the works? Uh, yeah, we can we can definitely talk about it. Um, uh, things are different after COVID. Like, we had had the game ready to go prior to covid and even uh publishing models for things before covid was a little bit different um you had a lot more people in the manufacturing game a lot of these people went out of business unfortunately um and a lot of what really took a hit was was print on demand services mm -hmm. so any place that would only have to print one or two copies of something you know their business was based on a whole lot of people printing small numbers and the rest of the printing business was based on a few people printing a lot. Yeah. So it was sort of the reverse. And we had based everything on this, this model of, okay, we can get X amount printed. We don't have to print 5,000 and try to get a price break. We can print 100. And the price wasn't that bad. And unfortunately, post-COVID, most of those places are just gone. So it's been a bit of a challenge for us to try to just get the game manufactured because it went back to the old model, which is you get price breaks at $5,000, $10,000, um, well, 5,000, 10,000 units. And sometimes these units run, you know, $18 a piece. And, it, and it's like, you know, for, for an average person who doesn't necessarily have, um, you know, a nest egg of a couple hundred thousand dollars it's it's just not easy to do right so we're still examining you know cost models like how exactly do we do this and you know crowdfunding is an option but even the crowdfunding model now has changed um it, it kind of stinks Dustin, because we're kind of like in a world of really really greedy people so all of these um like kickstarter services or these crowdfunding services really used to be like guys in their basement like it, it and that's sort of why these models were made you know kickstarter indiegogo a lot of these things were made because you know the little guy needed to be able to you know live his dream produce things get money get funding mm -hmm. and what we've seen now is that 
it's become more of an alternate revenue stream for the bigger guys because what they'll do is is they'll just release something a month early and put it on Kickstarter and then they get $2 million. And because their games are well-known from well-known game designers, usually they've got a license behind them, you know, so they're dealing with, with major franchise licensing. So the market's changed, you know, and it's, it's unfortunate, but you don't really have a, a lot of avenues that are looking out for the little guy, you know, they might've started that way, but now again, it's just another revenue stream for people who really don't need the money, but are just looking for a way to increase overall profit. And that, that kind of stinks. Yeah. Damn. Well, I, I wish you the best of luck with it. I really do. Cause it sounds, it sounds phenomenal. It, it, it sounds really awesome. And I, I hope the day comes where millions of people get to play it. Um, I, hope to be one of those millions because it sounds it sounds like my cup of tea right up my alley um i love D D. I love horror i love board games so it, it it sounds like a great time um ash i won't take up a whole bunch more of your time because i know that you're a busy guy you've got a whole lot of editing to do to make this great anthology uh effed to be yes. as great as i know as it's going to be um real quick is, uh, anything else that you wanted to to plug at out there anything else you wanted folks to be aware of that you know that ash hamilton has coming up uh i think for the most part just you know keep an eye out for updates about f because we are releasing some bts shots and you know um before too long we'll probably have a you know a, a teaser trailer out there we've got some teaser posters right now stuff of that nature um but you know i would just say people who haven't seen holes in the sky obviously it's still available on you know most of the major streaming platforms and, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty available, you know, people, mm -hmm. it's, it's easy to get a hold of me. It's easy to reach out. So, um, yeah, you know, take a look at what I'm doing. Always get on horror fix. We have a lot of, uh, you know, news about it, mainstream releases to real indie releases. We got some great interviews on there and, um, you know, just Google Ash Hamilton. I usually come up associated with horror, so right. <laughs> pretty easy to find me. Awesome. Well, and I can at least attest to that. He's not bullshitting. He is very available and around. Um, super, super incredible guy you are. Um, gentleman and a scholar, sir. You. You, you've been so kind to me um, and it, extremely helpful. Always willing to spend, you know, 30 seconds just to just to give me some advice. And I really appreciate that. That does mean a lot to me. I hope, I hope the day comes that I can, I can repay that to you somehow by, you know, whether it be giving you some sort of a, a credit in, in one of my films as a, you know, as, as something, you know, associate producer credit or just something. Um, I, I just, I want to be able to repay the, the kindness you've shown me somehow someday. Um, but for all the folks that, that don't know you heard it he is available um facebook do you have any other socials that people can reach out to you on uh yeah i'm, I'm usually under horrorfix um so horrorfix <laughs> we're on twitter um okay. i'm not on instagram that much um even though i have an account like like sadly i haven't really learned to use instagram that much <laughs> like i still don't really get it even though i i know that in the 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 media sphere it has value like i just i stumble through it um so mainly it's yeah facebook and twitter is probably two of the, the biggest ways to get a hold of me okay okay and i understand i have an instagram i think i've been on it for like seven minutes ever so yeah yeah it's like i still just see a lot of pictures of food and stuff on there like i just i don't know like I feel really old on Instagram. Like I feel like I'm really out of the loop and that I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, man. Well, I, I appreciate it so much. And yes, folks get to watching holes in the sky. However, you got to watch it. If you got to rent it, it's worth it. Um, it is on like Ash set on all the major streaming platforms to be all of those. Um, so watch holes in the sky. It is well worth it. Um, get on horrorfix.com. Check out that stuff. Um, Night Terrors Radio, that's your podcast. Um, yeah. Folks can folks can listen to you there. Keep an eye out for F Tales from the End Times. And again, um, you can find this guy on on uh, Facebook and Twitter mostly. Ash, I, I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much for 
for allowing me to have you as a, a guest on my podcast. Like it, I've been, I've been a giddy little schoolgirl all day. Like I really have. So this, this is an honor for me. I, I really appreciate your time, sir. I do. I, I, had, I had a great time, man. I, I love talking horror movies and, you know, I love talking about the eighties. So anytime, man, anytime you want to chat, just let me know. Perfect. I, I, I love that. So, all right, buddy. Well, you take care and uh, I will talk to you soon. Hopefully we can set this up again in the future. And I'd love to have you back on anytime. Yep. I'd love to just let me know. We'll make it happen. All right, man. Well, you take care. Take care. All right. Bye-bye.